There is no shortage of machines that can play cartridges from the original Nintendo Entertainment System, all with their own pros and cons. Simple clone consoles, the Retron 5, Analog NT, and of course the real NES, which can be modified for far superior video quality than was ever possible back in the day. But now there's a new challenger, and the way it works is completely different from any NES alternative that has come before it. Thanks to Retro USB for letting us take a look at their AVS. The Nintendo AVS, or Advanced Video System, was the name of a prototype NES machine that Nintendo abandoned before bringing us the system that we all know and love. The AVS by Retro USB pays homage to that old prototype while taking inspiration from the design of the NES. The AVS plays your standard NES and Famicom cartridges and outputs audio and video over HDMI. Of course, this is nothing new. The Retron 5 and the Retro Freak support HDMI, but they're lightweight computers running emulators. The HiDef NES, which we've previously featured, is a sophisticated HDMI mod for real NES consoles, and the exact same product used in the Analog NT. The Analog NT itself counts as an original hardware solution because it uses authentic NES processing chips on a redesigned motherboard. So what is the AVS then? Is it a clone or just another emulator box? A rebuilt machine using salvaged parts? Well, it kind of lives outside of the typical categories you might think of. We talked a little bit about FPGAs and RGB 207, which has significantly gone down in cost in recent years. FPGAs are highly versatile circuits that can be programmed by anyone to suit a wide variety of purposes, allowing firmware updates to add features and alter operations. FPGAs are capable of being trained for pretty specific functions. They serve as the basis for many of the advanced console mods we've seen in recent years. Even the open source scan converter is an FPGA at heart, and that's why it has so much potential within fixed hardware. FPGAs can even be used to mimic another hardware design, such as, well, why not the NES? The AVS is not original NES hardware, but it is an advanced circuit, an FPGA programmed to run just like the original hardware. It's not a traditional clone because the parts aren't simple approximations of the real thing, and it's not an emulator box either. Software emulators approximate the relationship between the game and the hardware through software, which is much more likely to be inaccurate in a variety of ways. What makes the AVS different is the hardware approach. You may call it hardware simulation. If you think of a console as essentially a bunch of transistors, then an FPGA can be configured to run a specific array of transistors. This is how the AVS is able to function almost exactly like a real NES. But of course, any approximation of original hardware, whether through software or hardware, depends on what is known about the original and how it's interpreted by the one implementing it. While there have been FPGAs capable of mimicking console hardware, like the MIST FPGA computer, the AVS is notable for being a no-fuss, consumer-ready option that actually uses original game cartridges. On the back, you've got a Famicom expansion port, HDMI output, and a mini USB port for power. It features four controller ports on the front. Under the lid, there's separate slots for NES and Famicom, front-loading for your nostalgic pleasure and top-loading for your imports. You might have to put in some extra effort when inserting NES cartridges, because it grips them really tight. Removing a cartridge also requires a bit more effort than an original NES. An important distinction that makes the AVS completely different from software emulators is that it does not dump the ROMs. It just interacts with cartridges like a real NES. A dirty or poorly seated cart might even cause some of the corruption that NES fans are quite familiar with. Oh yeah, it's also compatible with the Famicom Disk System, but it's kind of an awkward fit for the RAM adapter. Still, the point is, the AVS works with pretty much everything but ROB and light guns, since they wouldn't work on an HDTV anyways. It's also fully compatible with NES flashcards like the EverDrive. Upon booting the AVS, you're greeted by a simple radial menu. 
but come on, this is NES. We don't need this crap. Let's just go and set it to automatically boot straight to the game. Now when you power on the AVS, it's just like turning on a real NES, except it's on your HDTV and it looks really good. After updating the firmware, which was necessary to solve some audio glitches, we didn't run across any issues during gameplay that felt to us like the AVS wasn't performing exactly like an actual NES or Famicom. Well, okay, even if we do just want to get straight to the action, we should spend a little time setting things up first. Holding a button combination of your choosing brings you into the system menu, which, do note, does reset the game. Conveniently, the AVS has a built-in cheat engine, if you're into that sort of thing, with many pre-installed cheats. Or you can just use your old Game Genie book if you've got it. But let's get to the point. You're here for video options. The AVS is compatible with PAL as well as NTSC. The vertical border and hide left side settings are just there in case you're bugged by some of the overscan junk that tends to be around the edges of NES games. Similar to the Retron 5, the AVS has no resolution options, only supporting 720p. Maybe a little disappointing, but this is mainly to keep the AVS affordable. It works easily because it's very simple to scale the resolution of NES games 240p to 720p with a simple 3x integer scale. Your TV then is responsible for completing the scale to fill its native 1080p or 4K resolution. Depending on how your TV handles this, it is possible that you may notice some input lag, but we're told that the AVS itself does not have any inherent lag. Regardless, I feel that 720p on a 1080p screen usually looks really good. We were not able to test on a 4K screen, but 720p is a 3x integer scale to 4K. So if the vertical resolution is scaled three times, then the horizontal resolution must also be scaled three times, right? Well, it's not quite so simple, and that's what the pixel aspect slider is for. The default in the middle appears to be a 4x horizontal scale, but in practice it looks a bit too wide to my eyes. In comparing the AVS on my HDTV versus a PVM, I found the third step on the aspect slider to be the most accurate. But notice that with this setting, pixel sizing in the horizontal axis is not uniform. Remember, when NES pixels are displayed as intended, they are slightly wider than they are tall, not squares. On a CRT, non-square pixels appear to have equal width, but on a digital fixed pixel display, this can cause issues. In our episode on the high-def NES, we show how non-integer scaling causes a shimmer as the screen scrolls. For the high-def NES running at 1080p, our solution is to set the vertical pixel sizing to 4x and the horizontal to 5x, which is somewhat close to the correct aspect and makes for clean screen scrolling. In the time since we covered the high-def NES, a feature called interpolation has been implemented via firmware updates to blur the horizontal axis. At higher blurring levels, this does fix screen scrolling on non-integer scales, but whether it's worth the trade-off is up to you. As for the AVS, I found the uneven pixels to be less noticeable in regular play and the shimmer effect to be much less pronounced than on the high-def NES. In fact, I can't see it in Contra at all, but something does seem to be a bit off when moving at certain speeds in other games. Obviously, whether it bothers you is going to be pretty subjective. The AVS is 720p, so the perceived effect of non-integer scales is going to be a bit different than with 1080p. In the AVS menu, the far left, middle, and far right settings appear to be integer scales. On the other hand, when you use the NES RGB mod, or any other system for that matter, with a scaler like the FrameMeister or OSSC, these devices are digitizing and sampling an analog signal, which results in the borders between pixels being averaged. In other words, the horizontal axis is represented in such a way where integer scales are not necessary for even pixel sizing and smooth scrolling. Of course, you gotta have a scan lines option. The AVS allows you to adjust the darkened lines however you like. I find the scan lines to look really nice and even when my TV is set to screen fit mode. 
One more interesting video option is the ability to increase the NES sprite limit. The NES only allows 8 sprites per scan line, so when characters and objects flicker or partly disappear, it's because there's too dang many sprites. For me, it's just an accepted part of the NES experience, but for others, it's a real nuisance. The extra sprites option lets you nearly double the sprite limit, making flicker pretty much never happen. Though we aren't aware of specific examples, it is possible that this can cause some games to behave incorrectly, so keep this option turned off if that worries you. Another matter that we have to talk about is color. An unmodified NES literally doesn't speak RGB, meaning its colors have no defined RGB values. What the colors should look like is more a matter of interpretation and preference than an exact science. You could argue that the PlayChoice 10 palette for NES arcade machines is the official RGB palette, but it's rather garish and pretty far removed from actual NES colors. There's also Nintendo's Virtual Console, but it's weirdly dark and really blurry. The NES RGB mod and High Def NES default to popular palettes that had been previously established in emulators. NES RGB mods usually include a physical switch to change color palettes, while the High Def NES allows you to choose through a menu. As of launch time, the AVS has only one color palette. We've recently been enjoying a newer NES RGB palette called Unsaturated, developed by Firebrand X, the creator of the excellent Pixel Purist Framemeister profiles, who used carefully calibrated direct capture of the composite output colors of a North American NES. The result can be flashed to NES RGB boards, we think it is impressively accurate. This unsaturated palette has also already seen use in emulators, but as of the time of this video, the High Def NES and AVS do not support Firebrand X's palettes. Here's a look at how the AVS's color palette and 720p output compares to a variety of other ways to play NES games. So, what do you think? The AVS isn't necessarily the definitive best, but we think for a lot of people it's going to hit the sweet spot of quality, features, and price. At $185, it's not exactly cheap, but it definitely gives you nice looking NES graphics over HDMI for a lot less money than a high def NES, analog NT, or the cost of an NES RGB mod combined with a good video scaler. On the other hand, something like the Retron 5 costs less and lets you play games for a lot more systems, but the emulation is laggy, and not to mention illegally implemented, and it doesn't look quite as nice. Official methods from Nintendo don't always look the best, and the game selection is a bit limited. Of course, there's also the so-called NES Mini that's still a few months away as of the production of this video. It features an all-new official emulator that we hope improves the visuals from the Wii U Virtual Console. But remember, it'll be limited to only 30 built-in games. Rest assured, we'll look into how this device compares as soon as it's available. Since Retro USB can add features through firmware updates, we'd like to see support for additional color palettes, and if possible, an option for smoothing the horizontal scale to even out non-integer aspect ratios. You perform firmware updates through the scoreboard software, which is also used to submit high scores to the NintendoAge.com database. It actually is really neat how it works. You run the scoreboard software on your computer during gameplay with the AVS connected, while it checks the ROM for cheats and hacks. To coincide with the release of the AVS, RetroUSB is also releasing a series of NES carts featuring homebrew games, playable on the AVS as well as real NES consoles. We were sent a copy of 12 Seconds, a game where you die every 12 seconds, requiring you to use each life wisely to solve platforming challenges.
While the AVS is the first FPGA to be sold specifically as an NES alternative, we already know it won't be the last. We do have to wonder if this concept is too impure for original hardware aficionados, or if it will sway emulator fans to start building a collection of cartridges. And does either group care about the distinction between software emulation and this sort of hardware simulation? But the AVS is a worthy machine that we hope finds its audience, with HD output, performance indistinguishable from the real thing, and most of the features that we would want without things getting so overly complicated that it no longer feels like playing an NES. If it catches on, we hope to see this sort of FPGA alternative created for other, more technically demanding consoles at affordable prices.